Hi everyone, I'm Liz Linehan, your state representative from Cheshire, Southington and Wallingford. And I have a few guests with me today for our Ask a Pediatrician series on COVID-19. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Sakerin. How are you? I'm great, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure I'm so to talk. I'm so thrilled that you're here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your credentials? Sure, so my name is Dr. Anand Sakerin. And uh, my uh, profession here at Connecticut Children's is uh, head of the pediatric hospitalist. And for those of you out there who don't, aren't familiar with that term, uh, I'm a pediatrician who specializes in hospital medicine. So there's a group of about 15 of us, and we take care of any child who's admitted to the hospital who doesn't need uh, a surgery or intensive care, but is on, you could think of it as the regular hospital floors. And so my second job is to oversee all of the inpatient areas at Connecticut Children's and our team, like in any major hospital, the hospitalists uh, tend to be the front line uh, as we face uh, COVID-19 and this new entity we're gonna be talking about a little bit later. Um, so we are, we, my group uh, has seen the majority of children uh, with this uh, entity and this uh, COVID-19. And so I'm happy to talk about that, but I'm also happy to talk about general uh, questions as I know the representative may have. Uh, yeah, I very much appreciate that. And, um, and, you know, we've been receiving a lot of questions from parents who are concerned as the state is reopening and what does that mean for their kids. So your input is going to be greatly important. I also have with me Katrina Spina. Hi, Katrina. Hi, Representative Linehan. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm well, I wish I was seeing you in person, but it's nice to see you on the screen. As, um, as many uh, of my viewers or constituents know, Katrina Spina has been with me a few times talking about a few things. Um, and today you are here not as a teacher, but as a softball coach, isn't that right? Yes, that is. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing and why you're here. So um, part of my titles, I am the vice president of the Wilkett Girls Softball Association. Uh, we run an in-house rec program for girls in Wilkett to play softball. We also host um, teams from East Mountain and Pal from Waterbury. Uh, we typically run a um, April to June season for in-house. We also run a travel program, which consists of five travel teams from the ages of 10 and under, uh, two 12 and under teams, a 16 and under, and 18 and under team. Uh, the reason why I'm here is that these girls are anxious to get back in the field. Uh, parents are anxious for their kids to get out, but we also want to do it safely. Right. Uh, we also are hosting our Summer Slam tournament in July, where we'll be hosting teams from across the state. And you're hosting, um, and we want to make sure. Right, you're going to be hosting teams from Cheshire, from Southington, and from Wallingford, from all across the state. Um, and absolutely. on your team, you also have some Cheshire and Southington kids. Is that right? I sure do. Absolutely. So I happen to know your catcher. I think she's pretty nice. <laughs> she is pretty cool. She's not just a catcher. She plays a pretty good outfield too. Just saying. <laughs> well, uh, she might be listening. We don't want to. Oh, okay. That. So <laughs> Katrina, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of put you on the back burner for just a second while the doc and I discuss a few things and then we're going to bring you back in. Okay. All right, Absolutely. So, much. so doctor, um, one of the things that we've been talking about um, is this Miss C. So can you tell me um, a little bit about what Miss C is and what you are seeing? And then I'll ask some questions as we go. Absolutely. Um, so Miss C stands for M-I-S-C and, and the words are multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And so, uh, first of all, I want to start by saying we're, we're very much in the learning stage of this uh, new um, syndrome. Um, it was first described in late April uh, in uh, uh, the United Kingdom. Um, and then in uh, early to mid-May, uh, we heard more and more reports about a number of these cases in the New York uh, City area. And now we're seeing cases like this really in more than 20 states around the country and definitely here in Connecticut as well. So uh, MISTI is basically uh, what we think as we're learning more about this is that this is uh, an inflammatory syndrome that we think occurs at some point in time after prior COVID-19 infection. 
And I think it's really a, a fascinating uh, and in some ways concerning new uh, illness because, you know, you've probably heard before that children are relatively spared from COVID-19, thankfully, and that's absolutely the case. Uh, it's a very, very small percentage of the total uh, of infections um, that have occurred in, in the state and in the world uh, occur in children. And for the most part, children have been very, very much spared with a uh, small number of hospitalizations. So for example, um, you know, in the state of Connecticut, we have about 750,000 children, and only about 1,000 of them have become infected positive with COVID-19 and only about maybe 30 or so have been hospitalized. So about 30, 40 kids hospitalized as COVID positive out of 750,000 children. So you can imagine it, it, it's very well uh, tolerated by children. Uh, the tricky part is we don't know how many children truly were infected and never knew it because- uh, We need more know, testing. Some, yeah, some of these were n never had a reason for testing um, and so they may have been what we say asymptomatic um, um, COVID-19 patients who never knew it. And so what we're seeing now is something that's occurring anywhere from, you know, five to 15 days, somewhere in that range after COVID-19 uh, infection. And, uh, and basically what it is, is a, um, it's not an, a reinfection. It's basically the body's inflammatory response to the prior infection. So almost like uh, autoimmune disease where the body uh, has a very aggressive immune response and, and what happens is um, it is sort of like an exaggerated or overly exuberant response which then affects multiple organs. And those organs tend to be consistent over time. So can I, can I interject and ask a few questions here? Um, of Thank those you. kids that you've seen, uh, have they all tested positive for COVID or uh, for as an active infection, or have they tested positive um, for antibodies, or have you had some that haven't had either? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, the majority, um, when we see them for this, for suspicion of this MIS-C, um, actually test negative for COVID, but positive for the antibody. And so what that tells us is that there was prior infection, but not current active infection. And were and, they asymptomatic as well? Yeah, the majority were asymptomatic prior. So that's what's you know concerning about this new entity is that one could possibly not know that one's child was infected because thankfully kids don't have the symptoms that adults get and don't get sick. And then we're seeing a very small number uh, develop this syndrome of uh, Miss C which is an over-exuberant inflammatory response to multiple organs. So, uh, you know, a lot of times when I'm hearing from parents, it's, got, it's the same things over and over again. So let's do some quick hitting questions. Uh, what do we look for? If, the, if your kid is asymptomatic, but suddenly, suddenly starts to show something that is related to Miss C, what are those things that, that they're gonna see? Sure, yeah, there's, um, as such a new entity, the CDC actually created a case definition uh, very recently in which they renamed it. It used to be called PMIS, which was Pediatric Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome, is now called MISC, as I said, and they defined it very clearly. And um, so the typical symptoms are very high fever that does not go down. So I would say, you know, uh, 101 or so and above and it stays persistent. So we're not talking about a low grade fever where the child looks completely well, um, you know, running around and playing. Um, it's typically a very high fever. Um, other things affected that it's really common to have GI symptoms for some reason. So um, the child may have uh, abdominal pain, uh, vomiting, diarrhea. So GI is, is probably the second most common after fever. The third big category would be in the category of uh, rash and changes to the lips and the uh, tongue and uh, even the eyes and many of the uh, sorry what changes can you be specific about what you've seen as far as changes 
So the, that big category is in the category of, I'm sure many have heard of Kawasaki's disease. So when this first came out, people thought this was a variant of Kawasaki's. And so um, some of the symptoms overlap with Kawasaki's and those having to do with the eyes, mouth and tongue are that the eyes would look potentially red and injected, uh, the same sort of both sides, both eyes. Uh, and the lips can be dry and cracked and the tongue can be, you know, bright red and, and look different. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, there can be other uh, effects, uh, but the big ones are, again, high fever, the GI symptoms with abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, rash, changes on the lips and potentially the hands and the feet can get swollen. Okay, so let me ask my mom questions. Yeah. When you say a high fever and you say it's over 101, are we talking about um, what if we give them Motrin and it goes down? Um, then is that not a symptom? Or is this supposed to be a high fever that doesn't respond to Motrin? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the tricky parts about this is how many children have fever? It's like the most common symptom you'll see. So it's a little bit of um, trying to tease out when to be concerned amongst very common, you know, childhood illnesses. Um, so I would say, you know, the cases that we've seen that become more severe, the child typically has had fever for a prolonged time, uh, two to three days of very high fever, uh, right. you know, over 101 for two to three days. That doesn't mean you wait two or three days to get attention. It just means that you shouldn't uh, get too concerned if it's a low grade fever, the child looks very well in between and has none of the other things like the GI symptoms or the rash or the eyes or anything else. Right. So I've, I've been hearing from a lot of parents who um, have autoimmune issues and I'm actually one of those. So I find this extremely interesting. And I, and I will say that I find this whole um, mysterious disease interesting because it sounds very, very familiar to me, very similar to what I had when I was 20 years old. Um, I had a reaction from strep throat, which shut down um, my respiratory system, um, my heart and my kidneys. And so is this something that you are seeing now in response to COVID, but there's a possibility it could be in response to other things as well? Yeah, I think we're, you know, this is very much the learning stage because uh, as you asked in your earlier question, are there patients who are COVID negative and antibody negative? So there's no prior evidence of COVID. And there are some of those patients who seem to have the manifestations of this illness, but there's no evidence of COVID either by history of having had it or, or, or any of the lab tests. So we're in the learning stages of this um, for sure. But I think the, the vast majority of experts believe that this is tied in some way to COVID-19. Okay, and um, for those parents out there who have autoimmune issues um, and who are a little concerned that their autoimmune issues might prove to be genetic and put their kids at greater risk, would you say that that's a possibility? Yeah, so I would say for those kids, uh, the autoimmune conditions themselves don't put children at higher risk really for COVID-19 or for this MISI. But I would take a step back and say, it's vitally important for those children who are on medications that suppress the immune system, that they're in general super careful about some of the things we've been already talking about um, around preventing COVID-19. So I think where we are with this is to say, you know what, we need to prevent COVID-19 still. Like we need to do all those things that we've been talking about. And the big three that we talk about all day here at Connecticut Children's are social distancing, wearing a mask, yeah. and hand hygiene. Yeah. Social distancing, wearing a mask, and hand hygiene. And by distancing, you all know, you know, separated by six feet. Um, and that's going to have to continue, you know, for months. So I, I think that um, the key yeah. for those families with children First, are they on an immunosuppressive medication? And many children are who have autoimmune disease and many adults as well. And if that's the case, then there's a higher risk if one gets COVID-19 for having worse COVID-19 disease. Um, but interestingly, in Miss C, what we're seeing is that these are previously healthy kids. So we don't see any connection to 
a predisposition, a predisposing disease like in COVID-19 disease itself. These are typically um, previously healthy children who may or may not have had COVID-19 and are in a small amount. I want to uh, emphasize for your constituents that this is not a reason for panic because this is still a rare disease. Okay, we have to remember that this is still rare. So a, a very small percentage of even positive children probably uh, are the ones susceptible to this. And there's no way at this point to predict, you know, who that uh, child may be who has some of these manifestations. And then the final point, Representative, I want to mention is uh, to avoid the panic. It's not only rare, but most fully recover. So I want to make sure I make that point that even if getting COVID-19, which is itself not common in children, and even if getting Miss C, most of those, they can get very, very sick, in, including intensive care unit, um, um, and it can be life-threatening, but what we're seeing, thankfully, is that most fully recover. And um, that should be um, a flag for everyone that says, if you, if you see your child experiencing these symptoms, don't wait, contact your pediatrician because there is something you can do about it. You know, I can't tell you how many times parents sit at home and they're like, I don't want to be a pain. I don't want to call, you know, I, I don't want to overreact. Um, but, you know, as a pediatrician, wouldn't you rather they call? I mean, there's not any symptoms. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I think the pediatric community is very aware that there are going to be more calls. You know, my wife is, uh, I mentioned this to the representative, my wife is from Suddington and she is a nurse practitioner in primary care pediatrics. So they're definitely seeing more calls and more concerns about this and they're seeing more kids and mostly being very reassuring. Um, but it's, it's absolutely essential that you connect with your primary care provider uh, first, you know, when seeing some of those symptoms Again, high fever, uh, severe abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, rash, red eyes, cracked lips. Those are the, some of the typical initial features. Um, but a well-appearing child with a low-grade fever who's running around and playing and eating and drinking and doing his or her thing, you don't have to worry. Uh, you know, keep a close watch, do your usual. Um, but if things persist, definitely call your pediatrician. That is reassuring. Thank you so much. And then, um, you know, the second highest group of questions that I received after Miss C and concerned about their kids, if, um, if anyone in their family is immunocompromised, was sports. <laughs> People in Cheshire, Southington, and Wallingford and the rest of Connecticut want their kids to get back to sports. So with that, I'm going to bring in Katrina. Hi, Katrina. Hi. So, um, Doctor, I'm going to turn over some questions to Katrina, and then I'm, I'm sure I'll interject. Um, but uh, don't laugh, Katrina. Um, <laughs> she knows me too well. But um, we're, we have some sports-related questions. And while Katrina might be talking specifically about softball, I think that it's going to be important that we talk about all sports um, and how we keep kids safe. I think there are um, two factors here. You need to stay safe from um, the coronavirus and COVID-19, but you also need to stay safe in some of the things that um, we might be doing to try to alleviate the spread of COVID might actually be detrimental to kids' health as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Katrina, and you can ask some of your questions, Kat. Okay, so um, actually, even though my questions are probably geared more towards softball, obviously, they really are going to pertain to any outdoor sport that's being played this summer because it's, you know, they all, we all have similar concerns. Um, for outdoor sports like softball, baseball, there have been a lot of conflicting opinions on whether or not athletes on the field should wear masks while playing the game. Uh, some feel it's necessary, but some feel it's a health hazard due to possibly restricting their breathing and vision if the mask slips. And also it promotes face touching to adjust the mask that will undoubtedly move while actively playing. Now, due to the nature of the game, as well as being outside, do you feel that players wearing masks, I'm talking on the field during active play, are necessary to keep the player safe? 
Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think um, much of this is um, the general message of proceed with caution. And I think we are in a different situation now due to Miss C than we were prior to this because we're dealing with an unknown here. We're dealing with if children infect each other, which they will when you put them into uh, groups too close to each other, then we, it's very hard to predict what that second wave would be in terms of reinfections, or sorry, uh, infections, or uh, even more importantly now, the post-infectious syndrome that we're seeing. So I would say that, you know, I would answer that question differently two weeks ago than today. I'm more concerned now about resumption of sports and close activities um, than I was before this Miss C reared its head because it's just an unknown. Like we don't know what the uh, effects will be of this post-viral, post-COVID uh, <clears throat> syndrome. And so I think um, the key will be when sports do return, you know, the key will be doing it in as safe a way possible. So, uh, you know, distancing, uh, you know, I think it's, it's better to be outside than inside for sure. Um, contact sports are going to be higher risk than solo sports, obviously. Um, I think that um, uh, the question of masking is, is not an easy one to answer. I think it, it depends on a number of factors, but the key is, is the distancing and the hand hygiene. So are, are, is it possible to play sports and still be six feet apart? You know, one of the things that um, I've dealt with is my own children are in travel sports. So I I learn more from being a parent than anything I learned in medical school. So I have three children. One is in travel basketball, one's in travel soccer, and the third plays um, field hockey. And so those are all close proximity sports. And we haven't even in my own family decided yet what to do around summer sports. But I would say as a physician who's dealing on the front lines with uh, COVID-19 and also now with Miss C, I would proceed with more caution now than I was thinking, you know, two, three weeks ago. And what would those precautions be? What, because um, the governor has said that he's going to allow these sports. So for coaches like Katrina and others, uh, what would you recommend um, if the governor goes ahead with opening that uh, at the end of June? Well, I think if you think about how everything opens up again, I would use the very same principles in sports. So um, the physical distancing is probably the most important. Masking when able. Hand hygiene, avoiding touching one's face. I, I find it hard to imagine how any of that can happen in close contact sports. Um, so I think it, it, we're going to have to kind of learn as we go. And, and you know, one potential avenue is to think about it this way as things reopen and we all do the best as we can you know whether it's restaurants or uh, places of worship or sports what we're going to do is we're going to be really really closely watching so we have to you know through the deep page and through our governmental organizations we have to keep an eye on the ball and see are we seeing an increase? Are we seeing an uptick or a resurgence? And if that's the case, we're gonna to have to pull back. So, so my general advice is proceed with caution, institute the basic principles as much as is feasible, and then keep a really close watch on what's happening you know, on a week to week basis. And you guys should know here at Connecticut Children's, we report all of our cases um, through uh, to Connecticut Hospital Association, as well as to DPH. Uh, Department of Public Health so that we're monitoring everything really closely, um, particularly around uh, Miss C. So the bottom line messages are proceed with caution, you know, using the very same principles we use when we go to grocery stores and other uh, places um, and um, really do our best to um, be smart and then monitor uh, any responses or resurgences as we gradually uh, increase activity. It's not going to be a big bang, like I think you've heard this before. It's not a, a light switch where everything goes back. It's going to be a very modified and, and different way of returning. And Katrina, um, as you prepare to open, what are um, 
you asked about the masks and I know that, that you're doing that, but what are the other things that you're uh, looking to institute? So, um, and, and see if that gives the doctor, um, if he thinks you're on the right track. So we, um, we've been into, obviously, um, you know, so with being on softball fields, the kids on the defense are a little bit further apart. Right. And those are the ones that we were kind of saying, maybe, you know, relax the mess. Uh, we plan on having no more than the first three batters up in the dugout. We're going to have markers in the dugout so that they're six feet apart. We're going to have sections off behind the dugout where the girls who are not coming up to bat will stand and be social distancing. We'll have an adult whose only job is to watch the kids and make sure that they are um, six feet apart. The girls will be wearing masks when not out on the field, whether they're um, waiting to play or in between games. Uh, they'll be having, we, we bought the sleeve masks for all the girls to wear that are lightweight. Um, we are also um, directing traffic as far as spectators. We're limiting the number of spectators. We're asking that um, one uh, family member per player attends the games, looking at ways to stream the games for t uh, parents at home. Um, we're also going to be asking the questions of every person that comes into the complex. Have you been in contact with anyone with COVID? Have you experienced any symptoms? We're going to ask the coaches to check their kids before they leave their homes to ask those questions. Are no one checks going to be necessary, Katrina? We have talked about that. Um, we actually have a board meeting on Monday night. We're going to see if we can't get um, thermometers to actually make that happen. I can't answer that question for sure, but that is on the table and as doctor, a possibility. Doctor, do you think that the temperature checks would be um, really important in these situations? Yes. So first of all, Kat, I wanna say great job. Like that, what you talked about is a great start. I would say, you know, in addition, you have to remember that the path of this is that adults get sick easily and they have peaked first and the children peak may happen later. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing in the hospital at Connecticut Children's is that uh, we have uh, stories, histories of adults having illness in April, kids are fine, and then they come in with the child, the adult then is fine and the child gets sick later. So you have to remember that adults, unlike prior viruses, adults can carry this uh, as the vector to children, whereas mm -hmm. usually it's the reverse where children go to daycare and bring it home to the adults. Right. So my, my main point in saying that is that you've got to do the same distancing masking with the grown-ups. Yes. So grown-ups in connection with the children. And I do think if you can manage it, temp screens upon entry would be very helpful uh, if, if you can manage it. And then finally, um, you know, think about how you can encourage hand, hand uh, hygiene while you're even um, in the dugout and other places. Um, I know sanitizer is incredibly hard to find, but there are still ways to, to get it. And um, so I would institute all three that, that you've been talking about, the distancing, the masking, and the hand hygiene, but not just for kids, for adults as well. It's interesting that you put that up because I guess I've been putting together a plan based on from the USA softball organization and they also recommended we're um, actually con uh, considering taking one field of play out. Uh, we had three, which are pretty spaced out, but moving one of them over to the high school, which is a completely different location. Uh, we also are considering taking out the bleachers and requiring spectators to bring their own chairs. Uh, we also are going to ask that every player that comes to play has their own bottle of sanitizer in their bag. Uh, I don't, and we also do have public bathrooms that we'll be stocking, making sure, you know, we have volunteers, fortunately, from all of our teams that will be responsible for stocking and checking bathrooms, um, doing checks coming in. Uh, but we will be social distancing the spectators and also posting signs around the complex. Remember, six feet apart. Um, and so things doctor, like that. So I'm, I'm glad that you put that in because that's going to be good to educate our spectators as well. Right. And with all of those things, in the beginning of when we first started talking to Katrina, you had said that you haven't made that decision if you're going to allow your kids. Knowing what um, Katrina and the Softball Association are putting together, would that make you feel a little bit more comfortable? And I'm not, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I don't want your kids to watch this to say, hey, you said I could do it. But I, I mean, does that at least make you, as a parent, does that make you feel a little more comfortable? Yeah, definitely. And I think um, 
it's going to be essential that every sports team go through this in a very thoughtful way, as you have clearly. And um, I do think that some sports are going to be higher risk than others. You know, you can imagine certain sports, it's very difficult to separate and play the game. You, you can't really do it. So I think um, the other thing we have to do in parallel to all this, and I know the governor is doing this, is to look at what's happening in the outside world, the adult world. You know, thankfully, we're on the um, downtrend of new um, admissions to the hospital, new uh, deaths due to COVID-19. But there are still new cases every day, uh, uh, hundreds a day. So we have to remember that we're, we have to simultaneously keep an eye on, on, the, on the down uh, rate of the infection. And we're predicting here at Connecticut Children's we look at all the models, you know, we look at them from all over the country. And so we're predicting that early July, things will be much better in terms of the community spread of this disease, um, uh, in terms of how much COVID-19 will be out there in terms of severe disease, because the, we are seeing a downtrend in hospitalizations. That's great. Thank you so much. And Katrina, thank you for being here um, and asking questions on behalf of all youth sports. So Absolutely. we appreciate it. And, and you know, hey, if it makes the doc feel better, hopefully it's going to make me feel better as a parent for Zoe to get Good, it. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> so thank you thank so, you much, so much, much, doctor. Thank you so much, doctor and Representative Linhan for having me. I appreciate that. Thanks, Kat. Oh, we'll talk welcome. to you soon. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. And then, um, doctor, I, I am going to, I have some questions from constituents. So maybe we can do, I know your time is limited, so maybe we can do like a lightning round. That'd be great, no problem. Okay, great. So um, the um, second highest question that I got after sports was about grandma. Um, so the kids are all missing their grandparents and the grandparents are missing the kids. So um, if someone has been mostly self-isolating, staying home, practicing good hygiene, getting their groceries delivered, if the family with young kids have been doing that and the grandparents have been doing that, is it safe? then to start seeing the grandparents? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think many of your constituents know this, that grandparents are at the highest risk of all of the age groups um, with this disease. And so um, I think it's still worthwhile to, ex you know, to proceed with caution. Not that one can't visit it. So I'll give the example of my own family again. I, my children's grandparents are in Southington, as I told you. And so we have visited them, but we maintain a six foot or greater distance. And that's very hard for a family in my culture because it's all about the food. <laughs> hey, I'm, you know what, I'm Irish, it's all about the booze. So it's, we always, <laughs> it's always about the food. So it's been very hard because they traditionally will make us, you know, an amazing Indian meal and we'll all eat together. So we've definitely um, seen them because you know, one of the things I want to talk about, um, which you alluded to before, is what's what's really happening with children? What's the impact on children uh, around all of this distancing and isolation? Right. And so I think it's important to find that balance, honestly. Like, we have to have our children see the people they care about and have those connections, um, but do it in a smart way. So for grandparents, what I would advise is it is, it is uh, I think, uh, okay to see them, but I would do it the way that many people are, are moving towards that as the disease prevalence decreases, and that is outside, spread apart, no sharing of food, utensils, cups, all of that. Like we bring our own plastic cups, we bring our own drinks, and, and it's really about the connecting, you know. Uh, we underestimate in children and adults how incredibly important it is to connect socially. And you know as well as I do that the children are really good at this because they connect with their electronics better than uh, <laughs> better but than. That, you know. But that's another problem um, that that I'm concerned about as a parent. Um, my daughter, who was the most social person in the land, has been locking herself in her room. And her only social outlet has been texting and TikTok and all those things that I try to limit. Um, I limit screen time, but it's just, it's not, I'm not capable of doing that right now. I, I'm trying to find that balance. Are you concerned about their mental health 
um, when it comes to too much screen time, too much internet time, and too much time locked in the room? Right, yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's exactly uh, the, the challenge of all this because it is a balance. So I'd say, first, I'm not an expert. I'm not a developmental pediatrician. Just as a parent and a, and a pediatrician who's dealing with the same struggles that all of you are every day, I would say that we have to remember we're in a different time period. We can't use the same rules. Uh, we have to forgive ourselves first as parents because, you know, we beat ourselves up sometimes around, you know, they're watching too much, they're on the screen too much, they're playing too many video games or they're doing TikTok or whatever it is for too long. But we have to remember this. That is their way of maintaining social connections. Yeah. Um, it's not like video games when we were growing up where it was really just the video game. The video games and the, the apps that they use are their means of social connection. So if we say in society and for mental health, social connection is essential, we can't also say you can't do social connections with your uh, electronics. So then it comes down to balance. You know, what is considered sort of an acceptable amount of uh, social connectivity um, well, without it becoming overwhelming? And there's no right or wrong answer to that. It's going to be different, you know, based on your child and your own family. In our family, we've, <laughs> we, it's been, let me just say, it's been uh, all uh, constantly evolving. In terms <laughs> Same of, here. I yeah, don't know if you noticed, but when you said you have to give yourself a break, um, I, I, I kind of went, like, I, I sighed. I felt some yeah. of that stress go away because it has been quite stressful as a parent. I'm trying to do what's right for my kids. And yeah, it, and it's difficult, but we'll get back to the to the lightning round here. Um, so we also have uh, a couple of people who have asked. Um, they have newborns at home, um, and when is it safe to have people visit to see the newborn? Um, is there recommendations for visiting, such as staggered uh, people coming, limited time, look but don't touch? What about the little babies? Yeah, no, I think that's a an important question and. You have to remember whom you're talking to. I'm a pediatric hospitalist, so I see those little babies that I have to do spinal taps on who have a fever. And if they're under two months of age, we'll often do a spinal tap, regardless of the cause. So really? I would say that the, um, the advice is the same as it's been pre-COVID. Newborns are in a different category, okay? They're, I would put them in the same category as the elderly. You know, we often say in medicine that it's the extremes of age that we worry about, okay. the very elderly and the very young. So the neonate, the, the baby under two months of age is at higher risk, period, whether that's due to COVID-19 or due to any infection. So I would say, you know, again, it's similar to with the grandmother that uh, visiting is okay, but I wouldn't, um, I would be even more careful with newborns. I would say at a very minimum, distant 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 you know preferably outside i would even do masking i wouldn't have the baby handled by anyone who wasn't absolutely meticulous about hand washing wearing a mask and actually try to limit the uh, holding of the newborn by others okay you know so i am i'm a pediatric uh, neonatal person by trade so i'm super careful around newborns so i'm not saying you know, you can't show your beautiful new baby to your family, but I'm saying uh, do everything squared, like uber careful. Gotcha. And then um, pools. So the CDC did say today um, that, or, or yesterday, that there is no evidence that um, COVID can spread in the water. However, that um, you should still maintain social distancing. So what does that mean in the summertime? Can we have play dates? Um, it, it's hard to keep kids six feet apart. Um, if we keep it to one kid um, with another kid from another family, keep them six feet apart, can they play? And is it better if they play in a pool? Yeah, I would say the fact that it's in a pool doesn't really, um, change my approach okay. um, because the transmission of this you guys probably know is through droplet transmission so it doesn't have to be a cough or sneeze it can be vigorous talking vigorous breathing within you know uh, four to six feet of each other so 
I would say the pool part almost doesn't matter, except that you can imagine in a pool, it's even harder to stay apart because all the games and all the, you know, it somehow feels like a different setting. So I think, um, like we've talked about with other things, limiting the number of people, you know, maintaining that distancing, a mask is not practical in the pool. So you have to be very, you know, careful with distancing. Um, and, you know, making sure no one comes over who's been sick or exposed to any unusual risks. Um, and so I think we're going to ease into this, you know, like we do with everything. We're going to have to limit the number of kids. I don't think we can say necessarily no swimming all summer, but I think we're going to have to. Together. I mean, my kids are going to be swimming, but can we invite others yeah. over, I guess, was the question. Yeah. I think it's the same as having friends over for anything. Um, you know, you've got to find a way to limit the number and uh, encourage the distancing. Right. And then, you know, finally, I guess um, camps. Uh, people are, are unsure of what to do. You know, I think um, the governor is, is trying to do the best that he can to ensure that um, camps are, they're going to be in small groups and keep kids apart. But if you don't have to send your kid to camp or you don't have to send your kid to daycare, even with those rules um, at, that, that are, the governor is putting in place, as a pediatrician and as a parent, what would you say for both camps and daycare? Yeah, so I think um, for camps first, I think I would separate that into two categories, the day camps and the overnight camps. So Parker has uh, said no overnight camps. Yeah, so I, I was going to say I completely agree with that uh, approach. So in, in terms of the day camps, um, I think it's going to be sort of like analogous to returning to school. Camps have to decrease the numbers that they would have otherwise had, and they have to do all the usual me measures we've talked about with distancing. I think it is possible to do it, you know, at a later stage of the summer. Um, if it's done uh, <clears throat> carefully in all the ways we've been talking about. Um, in terms of daycare, that's a tougher one. I would say that, you know, as you know, it depends on the age of the child in terms of the ability to distance between young children. And that to me would be um, uh, a riskier situation with a younger child in daycare. Um, but balanced by that is the reality that. Um, for some reason, younger kids don't get sick as much. So um, I think that that's a positive, but um, you know, let's face it, some families don't have a choice after a while. If they need to go back to work, they're gonna have to figure something out and may not have access to a nanny or a family member. So I think that um, it's gonna be imperative for our daycare centers to um, do the best they can with promoting the safe practices. And then, as I said before, We've got to monitor what happens as we um, ease into this. And you know, I, um, with the takeaway that I that um, I'm, I'm getting from this conversation that we've had is that you know we can't put down our let down our guard. We're the state is reopening, but that doesn't mean that it's safe to go about your business. It means that you have to be vigilant. And, and right. you have to remember those social distancing guidelines. Um, and, and, and we're going to be taking all of your advice, actually, doctor. So I thank you so much. Are there any last words that you want to leave um, my constituents with? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I was really uh, I enjoyed talking with you uh, and for your constituents um, as well. So I would say, you know, I think we have to think about the big picture here. This is um, something that we've all had to face and, and it's been what I've uh, uh, breathed and, and drank and eaten for the last probably 72 days now is, is how far, believe it or not, it's been that long that we've been in this. Um, but we have to remember that these are children and they have other needs and have other uh, non-COVID things that are happening in their lives and in their health. So first and foremost, I wanna make sure people realize to continue all the important health care that they would otherwise get. So the biggest one on our list as pediatricians is vaccines. Yes, thank so you. It's so important to uh, make sure that your children continue to have vaccinations at the 
scheduled time. And a number of primary care practices that are affiliated with Connecticut Children's have put into place safe measures to give the vaccines, whether that's in the car or in a special area. Because you have to remember, what are we vaccinating against? Things that could come back very easily, like measles and whooping cough. That's, so those I, that's always been my biggest fear, uh, more so actually than measles, is whooping cough. Yeah, protest. So we, we're worried about that too. So please get your vaccines done. And secondly, for your primary care uh, providers, as well as for Connecticut Children's, we've thought about all this. We've been talking about nothing but this for the last three months. And so we have a number of measures in place to keep your children safe. So whether that's the need for a, a surgery or endoscopy or something you've been putting off out of fear, you should know that we at Connecticut Children's have done a number of things to uh, make sure that your children are gonna be safe because the last thing you want is to put off something they need due to fear of COVID-19 or MISI and then have them get much worse in that area that you've been putting off. So uh, we've been taking care of non-COVID things for three months while taking care of COVID things. You and so, it. yeah, so we're ready for you and uh, we're, we're gonna be safe for you. So see your doctors, get your vaccines and be safe. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I appreciate you. And now that you're um, a friend of the district, you might be actually be in my district, um, I hope we can call on you again and we can help put parents at ease. I always say knowledge is power. So uh, the knowledge that you gave us today is going to empower parents to be able to make the right decisions for their kids and their family as we move towards, uh, or right, rather through the reopening. So thank yeah. you so thank much. You for I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. And I hope to see you again soon. Yeah, I'll see you in Southington. All right, sounds good.